Okay, so it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce the, our keynote speaker today, Dr. John Dick. Dr. Dick is a senior scientist at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center and a professor in the Department of Molecular Genetics at the University of Toronto. Among his many achievements, he is credited for the first discovery of leukemic stem cell, and this early research of him changed the understanding of the underlying biology of acute myeloid leukemia and stimulated the exploration of cancer stem cells in other human cancers. Um, John Cohen's work continues to untangle the complexity of leukemia and normal blood development, impacting patient uh, diagnostic, st stratification, and treatment. John has received numerous awards and honors for its outstanding contribution to science, and this includes uh, the CIJ God Leaf Prize for Discovery, the International Society for Stem Cell Research Award for Innovation, and the ACR International Award for Extraordinary Achievement in Cancer Research. John is also an elected fellow of the Royal Society and a recipient of the 2022 Canadian Gardner International Award. So there is no way to do injustice with just a one minute introduction, but I have to stop here. So uh, please join me in welcoming John, Dr. John Dick. Well, it's a real uh, pleasure to be here, and it's uh, an honor. You know, your field has transformed our work. You know, you're taking a, uh, a humble, you know, stem cell biologist, uh, you know, been working on this for 35 years, and uh, what, what your field has done is really transformed our work, and I'll try to give you uh, an impression of that. And of course, you know, I'm not the, uh, the computational biologist in the team, so I'm the, uh, the spokesperson uh, for others in the, in the, in the group, and so I'm, I'm sure that there are many hard questions you could ask me <laughs> where I will have to uh, defer my answers to, but hopefully I'll give you enough details as to what we're doing and, and why we're doing it. Um, I'm just coming back from two weeks of vacation, so I'm somewhere between here and uh, dragging my grandkids around a tube uh, on a lake uh, in northern Ontario. But uh, hopefully, we'll, I'll try to put something together for you. So, so what I want to do today uh, is to uh, sort of, this is what my talk is about, you know, what makes a stem cell a stem cell. Um, <clears throat> and I uh, just want to start by giving a refresher uh, as to what we call a stem cell. And, you know, I, I guess if I can say, I, I know that this is, you know, the human cell atlas. Um, you know, what, what I guess I want to get across is the, the details of the individual cells matter, as opposed to just, you know, having a label on some kind of UMAC cluster uh, and so forth. And, and, and that understanding really uh, is important to making sense as to what that means, and particularly for uh, rare cells, which is what we're also dealing with here. So I'll just sort of give you our approaches in terms of how we've gone forward, but just so that we're all in the same uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, playing field. So, you know, all these cells, you know, we all have these nice, you know, uh, tree-like pictures of the blood system, lots of cells at the bottom, rare cells at the top, those are stem cells. So just to point out that, uh, you know, there's at least three flavors of stem cells. So these cells are all repopulating, they're all multi-lineage, so that's not a criteria uh, for distinguishing, let's say, uh, these the cells. What, what is distinct is that this cell, when you transplant it, will generate blood for a short period of time and then it'll exhausts. This one will do it for a longer period of time, and this one will do it in a permanent way, uh, long term, and you can even do it in a secondary animal. And that is the, de the definitive feature, and, and that feature is, of course, self-renewal, which is the canonical, really the only canonical property that distinguishes uh, a blood stem cell. And over the years, you know, we've been able to, we and you know, others in our field, but this is our work, uh, has been able to actually phenotypically uh, isolate these populations of cells, and then at single cell resolution, transplant them into individual animals, and prove that single cells have the ability to regenerate the whole blood system. Uh, and that, you know, is really powerful, and of course it's powerful when we want to try to interrogate our single cell data sets, because we can use this orthogonal data then to help validate, you know, uh, dots on a, on a plot. Um, and and uh, just to, to point out, you know, details right, that are different. So these cells are all not cycling. If you activate them to cycle, this cell at the top takes six hours longer to exit G0 and enter G1 compared to this cell here. And uh, that you know, becomes an important feature of the property of these cells. That actually is governed by CDK6, which actually is really important because that becomes a canonical marker that we can use for uh, looking at these properties when we see CDK6, for example, in our, in our data sets. Um, these cell, and, and that has led to the concept 
not just in the blood system, but in muscle and other stem cell systems. This is actually work from Tom Rando uh, in the muscle. But essentially the idea that these stem cells can lie at different depths of quiescence. Uh, and uh, where you are, you know, or there are different kind of properties or different kind of pathways that allow you to be, you know, right poised here or, or more deeply uh, in, in dormancy. And the point is that, I, the other thing I want to make in this point is that dormancy or, or, or quiescence isn't just the absence of proliferation, it's an actively programmed state. And there's a lot of work now which are trying to uh, underpin what that active programmed state is. Um, stem cells live in dangerous places, and it turns out stem cells are different than most other cells in the blood system, which is that they're much more sensitive to these insults. You know, they live in hypoxic environments. They're very sensitive to ROS, they're sensitive to DNA damage, uh, and other sort of inflammatory things, and that, that's what I'm going to talk to you about uh, for most of my talk. And what this, this, this was just a gene that came up in a screen. It happened to be part of the... Um, the UPR pathway. As we interrogated it, we realized what that led to was the idea that, uh, that stem cells actually are much more sensitive to proteostatic stress. They're also sensitive to DNA damage stress. And they will cull themselves rather than do pause and, re pause and resolve or pause and repair, whereas cells just downstream will do that. And the idea, I think the, the idea is that there's been a lot of evolutionary currency spent to protect stem cells from passing along damage, right? If I'm a blood stem cell and I'm going to live for 30 or 40 years in somebody generating, you know, trillions and trillions of progeny, I can't pass on damage or else, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm passing on a lot of damage. Uh, but of course, stem cells are important cells and if they have this low threshold for activation of death, how do they keep themselves alive when they live in these dangerous places? And uh, it turns out that they also have a component of the integrated stress response which keeps them alive uh, in this you know, lower threshold for death. And that turns out to be really important because some of this gets subverted in the process of leukemogenesis. So just to point out that these are all, you know, important processes that we've done quite a bit of work uh, to try to uncover we're quite interested in, in how a long-term, that cell at the very top of our hierarchy, uh, how, it, how it goes from, from quiescence into activation. So this is before a cell cycle event has actually happened, but when the cell has decided that it's going to do that. A lot of things happen uh, in that, and this is, a, I think, a really important paper. You can look at that. These cells have very high levels of lysosomes. Uh, essentially, it's a physiological way for maintaining dormancy. They keep clipping. Uh, signaling receptors off their surface so they can't signal uh, into these cells. And that's one of the first things that goes when these cells start to become activated. Chain MYC comes on, they changes their whole anabolic, catabolic processes. Um, I, I won't go to the details, I'm, I'm going to run out of time, but just to point out that we know a lot about this from sort of wet lab kind of experiments. And that, that becomes important when we try to interrogate uh, the powerful single cell data sets. So this is stuff that you guys are interested in and have seen a lot of, have generated these kinds of data. Blood is beautiful, right? You take a syringe in your bone marrow or your, blo or your uh, bloodstream, and you have the whole tissue right there. Uh, and you know we have these nice little labels on them, and they're something we call hematopoietic stem cells. The problem is that a lot of the early data, for example, that this was based on, they're based on bulk data. And the problem is stem cells are rare, right? They're probably one cell in 100,000, perhaps a bit more, uh, or a bit less frequent than that. And so no, none of these bulk data sets were properly populated with enough stem cells. And so um, that was a, a problem, I think, in terms of you know, how we were going to uh, create a proper map for the human blood system. And so Andy, what we wanted to do was secede this by uh, taking um, uh, uh, populations where we can enrich for more primitive cells. And CD34 happens to be a marker on primitive blood stem cells. Only about, let's say, one in a thousand cells now are a blood stem cell instead of one in a couple of hundred thousand. So it's, an, it's not purity, but it's an enrichment. But that, uh, there was enough data in this. We combined all this data, and so we generated a proper map that now is populated with enough stem cells that we can have some confidence in it. And so this is what we call a reference map. We're going to be submitting it soon uh, for some of you to review and to look at. But what we're interested in is the blood system, and what we're trying to figure out is, you know, how can we validate that? Well, we can go back to the flow sorting that I told you, where we have a lot of flow markers. These flow markers are linked to functional data. And so this is, we're interested in this sort of axis here. How does it stem cell go into the uh, megakaryocytic erythroid pathway or the lymphoid down here or the myeloid pathway. And so these are our set of markers that, that were published, for example. And so you can see that uh, when we take these, the data from these markers and seed them onto our map, you know, they seed pretty well into this, uh, into this primitive map. Uh, these are the cells just a bit downstream, and these are the ones which are going to go uh, up into the uh, you know, megakaryocytic erythroid pathway. You know, the details don't matter. This is the lymphoid pathway. Uh, so this is why we can put these labels on. We have a lot of 
uh, functional validation uh, that give us some confidence that this map is actually working in the way we want it to. And so we're interested, as I said, in the stem cell and you know, these true stem cells. What's the evidence for that? So this is now all the papers that we've interrogated uh, that have reported on a variety of cell surface markers uh, and linked them to functional data. These are the markers. Here's the source of cells. And so we sort of annotated all of these different data sets. So this is CD34 positive, so this enrichment. You can see it marks cells here, but of course, it, it, you, know, you can get pretty far into the rest of the blood system. It's not the most precise marker. You, you can probably figure out how a good people's sorting scheme is, because if they kind of get more loose like this, they probably didn't draw their gates properly in their functional data. Um, and then this is just you know, more 34. I mean, we go into the details of this. Uh, and, and, and now you add an extra marker in, CD38. Now you start to focus more into this axis here. Uh, now you add in this marker CD90, which was sort of the, originally the definitive marker. And then finally, we get into the, the, really, um, the really good marker, which CD4 to NNF, the one we brought forward. And then this is our own in-house data set. We actually sorted um, 5,000 LTHSCs and then ran them through a Rhapsody. Uh, to get single cell data, and so you know they all land there. So we have a lot of confidence, and we know that you know one in three or four of these cells will repopulate a mouse. So there's functional data linking to it. So you know we have a lot of confidence that if a cell, if we have any data set, and a cell lands in that window, we can be quite confident that it's a stem cell, and then we can you know bioinformatically essentially purify it uh, using this way. And so this is our question then is so you know so is this a pure population of cells very homogeneous high repopulating ability or is there heterogeneity here and and we already knew this from our early analysis but I'm just showing you the most recent data so this is all everything I'm telling you is is, is unpublished work in progress uh, Siam is a computer science student Andy's a brilliant MD PhD student and so we're asking what are the programs that are that are found in the cells that land in this window and so this was our approach um, to to try to uh, uh, look at the signatures that might be present so we used all of these uh, data sets uh, that that were available to us that ended up being that many um, data sets and that many signatures uh, this was the uh, uh, sources of the data that that come from this um, this is the approach that that Siam took uh, which is we took the, uh, the data, we purified it using reference map, and then we took a variety of steps where we tried to create, um, in this case, an NMF, uh, and ultimately we ended up with SNF uh, using the uh, uh, support of Bo, uh, who helped to uh, obviously bring that forward, to, to generate the clusters of programs that are present in the cell. So that's just where we, how we get to the data I'm going to show you in a second. Sorry, oops, just a second. Back. Here we go. So, what we came up with in that pure population of cells turned out that we could see whatever there's, you know, 17 meta clusters uh, that were, you know, driving different kinds of programs. You know, there were some here that were very uh, quiescence-like. Uh, this one caught our attention. I'm going to come back to this. Very heavy in inflammation, uh, NF kappa signaling, and so forth. Clusters sort of two to six, two to seven, something like, or two to eight rather. So just again, remember that. Um, and, and you know, the reason we can then uh, think about the biology behind this is, like for example, this cluster 11 over here um, is very enriched for genes that are in that activated versus quiescent. Remember, I told you that at the beginning, we had cells that were dormant and cells that had decided to activate. So we had data sets that underlie that, and you can see that this cluster is really enriched for cells inside that window. So our, our circle in our reference map must have cells you know, that, are that are transiting this, this, um, uh, this axis. And, and here are other, this is a, a heavy dormancy uh, a data set here, uh, again enriched in you know, whatever it is, signature six. So what I want to get to is you know, why is there uh, this inflammatory signature in these, you know, most of that data I'm showing you is on, on cord blood. Uh, why are we seeing this inflammatory uh, signature there? And that ha has stimulated us to carry out these experiments led by Stephanie Shi in the lab, um, who's uh, been leading these experiments done by Andy and, and Rataza. And, and so the idea is that, uh, you know, like all cells in the body, when they get exposed to uh, uh, stress, uh, they will get activated. One of those stresses is inflammation, right? Your body needs to respond. And it uh, takes these dormant cells and activates. And there's quite a bit of work in the mouse showing that this is actually true. Inflammation will cause a blood stem cell to become activated. Uh, but of course, what happens beyond an acute response, what happens if it becomes chronic? And there's quite a bit of data from uh, uh, Manuel Passage and uh, Eric Pietras outlined in this slide, which is that uh, in, 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 in chronic, chronic inflammation, Blood stem cells change, they become much more, they lose their balance, and they become much more myeloid biased. 
And this is a feature that happens not just with chronic inflammation, but you can see it in aging. You can see it in certain aspects of disease. And these are often the precursors that lead on to um, malignancy. So this is all done in the mouse system. The question is, what about the human system? Uh, are any of these things operating in the human system? And so we carried out an experiment. We took cord blood cells, transplanted them into mice. We waited for engraftment to happen. Then we hit them one, with one shot of a TNF or LPS versus a PBS control, and then looked at the cells 16 hours later. So this is the equivalent of an acute response. And what you can see is, and these are in, each dot is a mouse, and so you can see that this is the level of engraftment uh, in the PBS control. Uh, 16 hours later, there's been a, a marked reduction in engraftment uh, in the TNF and the LPS controls. Uh, and you know, the balance is, I won't go into the details, but essentially there's been an acute response. It's exactly what you would expect. If you look uh, now a little bit later, two weeks later, you can see it's completely recovered. So it's an acute response, the cell recovers. And so the question then is, well, what happens if you try to do uh, a response, if you look at these cells you know, later, and uh, what you can see is that you, know, you do the response, but you wait now 20 weeks, there's really been no effect at the blood stem cells uh, with that single shot of TNF. So that's kind of, kind of what we would expect. But what happens if we do something which would mimic a chronic response. We transplanted, hit them once at two weeks, then we waited, hit them again at 10 weeks, and then we read them out 20 weeks later. So there's been two and a half months since the last time they saw a single shot or a, a dual shot of this. And there's been a, a, a continuing memory of uh, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the graft. So the graft is much lower. Um, the, there's a, a change in the bias. There's, there's more cells that are myeloid biased, for example. And if you try to transplant these into secondary mice, they retain memory of that, and they still don't give a perfectly good, a very, as, as good a graft as the PBS control. So these two shots have induced some kind of a memory that we can see in stem cells that persists into a secondary transplant. And the question is, what's encoding that? Where is that coming from? And uh, so we carried out this experiment where we then did enough pools of mice. Stem cells are rare in these animals, so we had to have quite large pools of mice. We sorted the human primitive cells out, and then we carried out multi-ohm uh, in, uh, in these studies. And uh, this is the data we would get. And then so we basically purified, if you like, our analysis to the stem cells at the tip here, and then carried out the, the multi-ohm analysis on these. And what we came up with was this recognition that there's actually two stem cell populations. There's one kind of a homeostatic population that is linked, uh, like, like all of these stem cells we've studied till now uh, is here. And then there's this other population, we just called it HST2 at the beginning. Uh, it's a stem cell by all the criteria, as all the pathways that we expect, but it's, it's pushed off to one side. And you can see that uh, if you hit them with TNF, it's really pushed off. And, uh, and then LPS similar, uh, it's pushed off. And the question is what distinguishes this? What's different between that one and that one? You can look at all the differential you know, binding sites, the differential gene expression. And so the question is, what, you know, what underlies this data? So we carry it out uh, by looking at Chromevar and looking at Scenic, two independent ways to look at the two transcription factors that are used, uh, comparing one to two. And what you can see is that pretty much nothing happens with the HSC1 population uh, when it's exposed to the, to the signal, to, to, the, to the hit of uh, TNF. Whereas the, uh, and the same thing is true for the, uh, the, the ATAC sites, and, and the same thing is true for the prediction of TFs from the gene expression. But the HSC2 population is very sensitive to the TNF. When it gets exposed, you see there's a lot more uh, TFs that come up here. You can see both of them, and they're very consistent. I'll show you a blow up of this in a second. But the top hits here are all AP1, FOS, June, uh, all the kind of hits that you would expect for an inflammatory response. So there's something about this inflammatory insult which is hitting this new stem cell. Uh, anyhow, so here you can see the, uh, the blow up of the, uh, the hits that are there for the aficionados. OK, so um, don't think to introduce this audience. Uh, so Scenic, of course, was used originally for TFs from gene expression data. Scenic Plus now can integrate all of the data using the, the, the uh, joint embedding of these. And so we ran Scenic Plus uh, on these data sets. And what I'll show you then is the kind of data that we have where we can look at gene expression. So this is the HSC2, the HSC1 population. And this just happens to be CF, you know, CBP alpha, just to show you. It's you know, expressed mostly in the GMP population down here. Uh, this is the uh, regulons based on chromatin peaks. They're all there. And these are the ones based on gene expression. They're all there. So it just you know, works well. Uh, and so this is what if you look at our data. Here's NF kappa B. So all expressed in that HSC2 population, that new population. There are the uh, ATAC binding sites. There's the predictions from the TFs. 
uh, from the gene expression. Here's uh, rel, uh, similar thing. So this is a really inflammatory uh, signature. Uh, here's June B, or sorry, June D, here's FOSS only in the HSC2. So I think you know, we have a lot of uh, uh, con consistent, here are the NR, uh, NRA uh, family members, also very consistent in this uh, population of cells. And so what it looks like then is that we have two populations of stem cells that we didn't know existed. One of them is very sensitive to an inflammatory response. And so you can see that uh, you know, compared to the PBS control, you know, nothing is happening for genes that go up and genes that go down. Um, here are, is that HSC2 population. It already in the PBS control. You can see that it's distinct from the HSC1. And then it gets really potentiated when you throw the TNF on for all these uh, different um, uh, transcription factors and similar things for, for gene-based. And so um, one of the things we noticed when we looked at the data was that, uh, in fact, the HSC1 and HSC2 are distinct for one other feature, and that is these cells are much more uh, quiescent. So these cells are more, these cells are more, this is a coalescent signature. So these cells, even though they're, they're activated and they've been stimulated, they're actually more quiescent. And I'll, I'll explain why I think, what I think is going on here. Uh, and so just to, just to summarize this part then, so we think we have two populations. Uh, one po stem cell seems to retain memory uh, of a prior inflammation uh, stress response. And, uh, and so then the question is, well, you know, is this real? Uh, you know, other than just an experimental model, we put a human cell on a mouse, right? How, how real is that? So, it, you know, the, the, the main uh, uh, kind of cell where we understood inflammatory memory is a memory T cell. And uh, so there is a beautiful paper published from Rafi Ahmed where they took uh, volunteers, um, gave them a yellow fever vaccine, and then they fed them heavy water. So you could see cells that had picked up label. Uh, and then had lost the label. And so then they looked at uh, cells, you know, a decade later, found the heavy water positive cells. So pretty good establishment that this is a long-term uh, memory type of cell. Generated a signature between these two. And we looked at the signature then of the long-term memory T cell. And we looked at our HSC memory cell and you can see a massive enrichment. And so it looks like the cell has, or, or there's only one kind of uh, inflammatory memory, the stem cell has, has uh, uh, captured the same kind that, it, that occurs uh, as, as what happens in a memory T cell as well. And if we do the, this, the, uh, the experiment the other way around, which asks how well does our memory um, signature uh, embed in the long-term memory, or sorry, our HSC uh, inflammatory memory uh, embed in the long-term memory, it also enriches very, uh, very well. So it, it works in both directions. So, okay, so that, that's fine, you know, another other population, but, but what about in, in anything that's real? And so we happened to come across a, a, a bio, a bio archive paper from uh, Steve uh, Josefowitz from Cornell, uh, who had data from patients who actually been exposed to strong inflammatory uh, stresses. And so they had fortuitously gathered bone marrow data from those patients. And uh, so we could then remine their data and so we mapped their data onto our reference map. And so these are patients who had been in the ICU, so very severe disease, sick enough to be in the ICU, and then they've recovered. And he took a bone marrow four months after they recovered. He had matched controls of people who had been in the ICU, but for non-inflammatory reasons, and also recovered and are at home. And then there were age controls that were, that were age matched. And so we compared these together. And what we showed was that our HSC memory signature uh, is, is very enriched uh, in those patients who have uh, experienced a, 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 a COVID infection. So remember, these are, the, these are stem cells, right? This is bone marrow. We focus, use reference map. We focus on the cells that land in that window and said of the stem cells in these patients, we can see that, that, uh, that exposure here. And this is just the, uh, the GSEA uh, in, those, uh, in those samples. And so we now have a, a, you know, a real life uh, patient setting. It seems like this isn't just an artifact of our experimental setting. There's something about these inflammatory memory cells that seem to be relevant. Now, one of the things, of course, that happens is that blood stem cells age. There's been a lot of work to study how blood cells change with aging. And uh, of course, as we age, we're the you know, the sum total of the inflammatory experiences that we've acquired over those years. And the question is, what happens with aging uh, with this inflammatory memory signature? And so we have access to, there's some published data between pediatric and young adult. And again, you can see our memory signature comes up very uh, highly in the young adult compared to the pediatric. And then we have in-house data of individuals who are young adult. So this is our own multi-ohm data of a couple of individuals who are young adults, some that are multi-middle-aged and some that are elderly. 
And we have other data I'll show you in a moment with our colleagues in Oxford. And you can see that there's a real increase uh, in this signature uh, with, uh, with, with age. So, so this is a, a signature we can see in real data uh, of individuals as they age. So there's a component then of, of blood stem cells uh, that seem to have that memory. So now just to go back to this, uh, this uh, uh, NMF analysis, remember these signatures here from about two to eight were the ones that really pick up the uh, inflammatory memory signature. And so the question was, how does this relate to the data I just showed you from aging and, and other different features? And so uh, here's an example of uh, this signature here, you know, very enriched, uh, you know, for, uh, or our signatures of inflammatory memory are very enriched in this HSC2 population. So it's like an independent way uh, of looking at that, uh, of that data. And then here, is the uh, uh, that, that long, same thing, this is the, the NMF generated clustering, and you can see again that that long-term memory T cell that I showed you earlier in, in, in that analysis was enriched. Here in this analysis, you can see it's very enriched in you know, signatures seven and eight. So these are why we can say that all those signatures from two to eight are really enriched in this HSC2 population. And now, I think if the next one should be, yeah, here's the aging signature. So you can see that you know, here are males at 24, 26, 58, 57, 70, and 77. So you can see signature four is going up, signature five is going up. Um, same thing for all of these signatures. So again, these independently generated NMF signatures are showing that there is an underpinning of, of uh, an aging feature uh, that underpins these HSC memory uh, stem cells. So, so this new stem cell that has memory of a prior inflammation uh, is not just linked to an experimental setting. We can see it in, in, in normal aging data as well. And so then the last part uh, is um, we know that as stem cells age, um, people can acquire mutations. Uh, and that's called cloning mapoiesis, sort of. It's one of these uh, features that came up about 10 years ago uh, and uh, is now underlying you know, many different aspects of, of human aging, you know, from cardiovascular disease to neurodegeneration and so forth. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to link all that together. But this is just an idea that if you have multiple stem cells, in you and I, we have you know, 100,000 or so stem cells that are active. And so no one stem cell makes more than one one hundred thousandth of your blood system. But every now and then you pick up a mutation and it can pick up, you know, 2% of your blood. So it's a massive enrichment or out competition of that stem cell if it picks up a DNMP3A or a TET2. And uh, in a variety of uh, data sets that have been published, these are uh, very common. Um, it's also known that, so data that we had generated some years ago, we'd shown that every leukemia patient um, we could find in their normal blood at diagnosis normal stem cells that had picked up the first mutation. And so that then led to um, a, you know, a study linking um, the, the um, clonal hemopoiesis to pre-leukemic condition. That's work actually Sagi did when he was in the lab. So you know, <clears throat> this is common. Leukemia, even though this is linked and it's enriched, it's still rare, right? Leukemia even with aging is still a rare disease. But it turns out you can actually pick up these individuals and show that this is actually true. And so this was the study that we did. Uh, there we go, hold on. Okay, so we uh, uh, in investigated the uh, EPIC uh, data set, you know, generated in the 90s, 500,000 Europeans, somebody gave a blood sample, they filled out a questionnaire, and they allowed themselves to be followed over the decades. So we went to EPIC and asked, do you have any individuals who sometime after enrollment got AML? And they picked up, uh, you know, 100 cases. Uh, who have people who got AML sometime after enrollment. And we picked up, we did a four to one match, individuals who were tracked for more, many, several decades who never got AML. Um, that was validated with an independent cohort from our UK colleagues. So we had you know, uh, about um, 800 samples or so in this full data set. And we sequenced all of these. And what became clear, oops, I guess I'm missing one data, but what became clear is that the, uh, if you go on, so this is the group of people who have colonial mapoiesis who never get leukemia. This is the group who uh, ended up getting leukemia sometime within a decade later. And so you can see that at enrollment, right, so when they don't have disease, at enrollment there's a dif difference between these. These ones typically have one mutation. These ones will have two or more. Uh, they get their, their mutations a, a, a decade earlier and they pick up a different spectrum. So if you're going to go on and get leukemia, you're picking up splicing mutations, a couple of signaling mutations and so forth. Whereas if you're not going to go on, you typically just have 3A, TET2, and AXXL. 
Um, and the other thing is if you look at the mutation itself, it's typically a DNA dam or it's an oncogenic mutation. So if you use cosmic, uh, if you're going to go on in the blue and the blue red here and get leukemia, you typically have um, oncogenic mutations compared to people who are just have a benign disease. And then lastly, this is the VAF. So the size of the clonal expansion is much higher uh, at enrollment uh, or a decade before uh, compared to those who uh, just have benign. So these are three different features that can be brought together into a model that was very accurate at predicting who's going to go on and get leukemia uh, a decade in advance. And so the question then becomes is how do we link, you know, uh, uh, clonal hemopoiesis and, uh, with, you know, with, with, with aging and this inflammatory memory uh, signature? And so, sorry, that's what I think I've just said everything here. Uh, and so we've been able to collaborate with uh, Paresh Vyas um, at, uh, at Oxford. So Paresh has uh, brought forward uh, target sequencing. So doing a, um, a plate-based single cell uh, analysis, so you can capture all the phenotypic information and then do genotyping as well. And so you can have individuals here who have colon hemopoiesis, individuals who don't. We take their bone marrow, we look at the stem cells and some of those stem cells will be, will be uh, non-mutated and some of them will be mutated. And so we can carry out all these experiments, right, comparisons. Uh, we can ask what are the signatures of the mutant stem cells compared to control stem cells? And what about the non-mutant stem cells of an individual who has clonal hemopoiesis? So is there any exogenous uh, exposure or environment which is influencing these cells? And so what we saw was that there's a massive enrichment for our inflammatory memory signature in the patients who have the mutant stem cells compared to the control stem cells. That's this comparison here. And that's true for individuals who have 3A and individuals who have TET2. So it's a massive enrichment. I'll show you in a second how important the enrichment is. And if you do it the other way around, which is how do you compare this stem cell here with this stem cell here, this was the surprise. And that is we still see a massive enrichment for an inflammatory memory signature even in these uh, wild type stem cells from an individual. And I think what that means, there's two possibilities, right? One is that we know that the, um, the CH clone can create an inflammatory milieu. Um, often the myeloid cells that are generated from those stem cells have uh, higher levels of IL-6 and other kinds of inflammatory signaling that you know, can create an inflammatory condition. And so it's possible that these stem cells here are creating an inflammatory condition that these cells are sensing. But I think the other possibility is what I've showed you in the earlier slide, and that is that it's possible that what's happening is that as we age, many of our stem cells are actually going into, uh, are, are being affected by the chronic inflammation that we are experiencing. And what happens is that, so I showed you that if a cell experiences many chronic inflammations, it drives these cells into quiescence, into dormancy. And so there could be uh, you know, a, a, a lesser usage of stem cells with aging. And I would just er, r remind you, I should have the slide up here, but uh, Peter Campbell had a beautiful paper in Nature and Elisa Lorente last fall where they had done you know, whole genome sequencing on single clones of the blood system and they essentially made this remarkable conclusion, which is you have 100,000 stem cells that are pretty active until you're about 60, 65, and at 70, you end up having 10 stem cells. There's a massive compression in the diversity of blood stem cells. And I think what could be happening is that as we, as we are experiencing inflammation, more and more of our blood stem cells are actually HSCM, HSC memory. And then that creates a very strong selection pressure to pick up a mutation because these cells are, are, you know, are, are really being pushed into dormancy. And so you need 3A or TET to actually you know, give them a proliferative advantage. And so the reason that you're getting this is not because they're being exposed to an inflammatory CH stem cell. It's because that's the source of, of your blood stem cells when you pick up the, um, the, this mutation. So you know, those, are, those are difficult to do, but they're testable hypotheses. Um, so the clear, clearly, though, there's a link between our inflammatory memory signature and CH. Uh, and, and then, of course, the link would be to malignancy as well. So just to um, point out you know, how strong is that association. So we asked you know, this, this enrichment of this inflammatory memory. We uh, generated, you know, whatever that is, 9,000 um, you know, gene sets or pathways annotated from the literature and just asked how strong are they uh, in this association. And you can see the, 
the, uh, uh, the curve here, and you can see that the top hit here is our HSC memory. So one out of 7,000 is up in there. So it's a really strong association uh, with, this, uh, with this CH um, uh, stem cell. So uh, there's something really important, I think, underpinning this. So I think I'm going to close at that point, leave some time for questions. But just to point out that you know, mining data sets with biological information is really important. We couldn't have done this without our single cell analysis. In fact, we, we might have missed it if we would have only done a single cell RNA. Actually, it was really important to have the multi-ohm to get the, um, the proper, the, the joint embedding was really important to distinguish the, the two populations uh, of cells. And then we could harness all of the functional information that has existed in the blood system for, you know, for many decades uh, to try to mine this information to get extract information out of it. Now, just posit that it's likely that this inflammatory memory signature is probably true for other stem cell systems. I'd be surprised if it wasn't true. Well, first of all, we know it's true. Um, Lane Fuchs has shown uh, a, a similarity in the sense that skin stem cells can also retain memory of an inflammatory response, a bit different than this. And I'll bet it's going to be true in other systems as well. Uh, and so, you know, I would encourage you as you're building your human cell atlas to uh, consider this. And, and I, I guess the last thing I would say is really important, I think, that when you're you know, creating your atlases for skin and muscle and other things, just take care on the numbers of cells that are there. Because often, if you just do a bulk analysis, you're going to end up with the, the problem we had at the beginning is, yeah, you can have a few cells that we can say HSC but, or stem cell, but there aren't enough of them, and you don't have a lot of confidence to actually place them in that, uh, in that window. So uh, to try to take as much information as you can to try to do that. So I'm going to stop at that point and uh, take questions. Thanks. So we have time for uh, uh, questions. Do we have from the audience? That's one over here. The white shirt. Go ahead. Oh, we'll get to you next time. Um, great talk. Um, until you sort of came to the end, I was telling myself the story that the, the inflammation response or the other stem cell population is probably sort of has clonal benefit. That's why it's sort of coming up. But in the end, you sort of kind of refuted that. So I wasn't sure. Can you sort of comment a little bit well, more? Well, so first of all, I'm speculating. This is all brand new, right? So, uh, so we don't have any proof for what I'm going to say next. But it, to restate what I said, I, I think that, um, I think that uh, uh, you know, one of the, one of the fail-safe, so uh, all our cells in our body need to respond to stress. And inflammation is one of those stresses. And it turns out that it's not just the professional cells, you know, myelite cells or T cells or whatever. Stem cells are sensing that as well. Um, and I think that, but the, and so, you know, the initial, you know, evolutionary pressure, of course, is respond, respond. But there's this other layer that I sort of in, in, uh, suggested at the very beginning, and that is that blood stem cells, out of, out of any other cell in the blood system, they have a strong pressure to resist being continuously activated because that, ha that raises the risk for them acquiring damage. You know, every time they get out of dormancy and they start to have a cell cycle, they're going to potentially uh, acquire damage. And so they have a lot of, I think, uh, you know, mechanisms to try to survey, surveil themselves. And so if you get this chronic inflammatory response, the failsafe is put myself into dormancy. I'll, uh, you know, even though I'm an active stem cell, I've been hit you know, 10 times too many, and I'm going to now put myself into dormancy. And if that's happening to many, many of my stem cells over time, and I'm now 70 years old, you know, I, I don't want to just die. I want to have a stem cell that keeps me going. And so now there's a lot of pressure to pick up a mutation to try to overcome that, uh, that, uh, that restraint. So that's all hand wave speculation. <laughs> Hi, um, Ms. Hanifa. Thank you. That was a great talk. I have kind of slightly three questions. I was wondering, from what I understand, every hematopoietic stem cell has that capacity to acquire the memory program if stimulated, rather than there is a predisposition. So, so this is something that we're trying, we're working hard to try to, uh, to uncover. So is there a, is there a, a is there heterogeneity within a pool of stem cells where some cells are more favored to acquire this inflammatory memory signature? You know, one of the things that I'll just sort of 
raise another you know, issue, and that is that one of, the, um, one of the things that change between dormancy and activation, we can see this in cord blood, uh, is that there's a whole set of endogenous retroviral elements that go up. And so this is just part of the natural program of how a cell is changing. And of course, that raises the whole issue of viral mimicry. And, and so some of what we're seeing here could be just an underpinning of, of us having to deal with this late, you know, this burden of, of ERE's that, that are there. And that's, that's, what, that's what the underpinning is, is about. And so it's possible that there is a, a subpopulation which is a little more predisposed for acquiring that. So at this point, we can't say exactly. Thanks. And, and therefore, that memory, does, how far down does it kind of like is expressed, I mean, with the earliest progenitors. Uh, because I was wondering with the COVID data, because you looked at the bone marrow, and there's quite a lot of blood data where there are HSCs, and whether that memory signature would be in some of the HSCs that are circulating. They, they may be very different to the bone marrow, but I just wondered how far down. So that HSC memory signature uh, that, you know, that we generated there, it's actually very, it's very, it's very, well, it's very precise to the blood, to the stem cell and not into the downstream populations. So, you know, it, 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 there is a, a flavor of it being a stem. It's, it's part of a component of a stem population. So even the CMPs, GMPs, they don't have it. They don't, ex, they don't express it. Do we have a question for the virtu from the virtual audience? Okay. Hi, thank, thanks for a nice presentation. Hematopoiesis has been sort of one of maybe the example, right, where sort of a lot of single cell things happened. We do have sort of, I think there has been a lot of methods built that sort of describe the gradients in the differentiation, and people have been re asking the question whether there's even such a, a thing such as a CMP state, whereas it sort of maybe branched earlier or sort of more gradient like. You're describing populations all the time. For you, it's this, this bucket, then this bucket, then this bucket. No gradients, no, no interest in the dynamics. I mean, is it like a more continuous need for model or something like that? So I, what, what, I, what I need to do is introduce, a, you know, a, a, a different vision or a different uh, uh, graphic uh, for the blood system that, you know, so we had one of those papers in 2016 uh, in, uh, in science where we had described the fact that, in fact, the tree view of the blood system is wrong that intermediate population of oligopotent progenitors yeah. doesn't exist. It's just really, it's just, we call it a two-tier hierarchy. You essentially have a set of progenitors which are all unilineage, mm -hmm. and then you have a set of stem cells which are all, they have the capacity for multipotency, they have some biases, mm -hmm. and then those biases are what you, you know, feeds downstream, but that actual CNP type population, they're actually artifacts of, of our sorting schemes and how we do those analysis. <laughs> Having said that, you know, there, some of the heterogeneity that came from some of the early papers, so, you know, Andreas Trump and others had, uh, you know, you talk, whatever, you know, cloud HSCs, but the idea that there's just, it's just, you know, the cells are very equivalent and they just bias themselves yeah. a little bit. You know, I think that some of that was actually bioinformatic artifact. Yeah. Uh, we can actually see more discrete populations there uh, I mean, yes, there's a gradient, but we can see more discrete populations. And in some cases, we've proven that because we actually have come up with a cell surface marker, and we can take two populations and actually prove that they're actually you know, independent and distinct. Do you think it would be interesting to sort of come up with a dynamic model that sort of explains how they exit from this sort of super quiescent to this less quiescent yes. state and sort of get the dynamics in there? So, so the, the one paper that, that well, on the, the one slide that I had there, um, so with Matthew Lupian, we, we did you know, some of the early work on uh, ATAC sequencing uh, in exactly at that phase of cells which are dormant and cells that are activated. We combined that with low C and high C. And what we showed was that in the, in the long-term dormant state, there are 280 regions that are open uh, and accessible. They have CTCF bound at one site. And when that cell makes the decision to start to divide, all of those 280 sites have to fold and repress uh, those sites. And if you just silence CTCF a bit, you, you basically prevent the cell from doing that. They, they don't die, they just stay in their dormant phase. You prevent them from activating. So I think that's the kind of data set we need. You know, the, clearly the 3D genome is, is playing an important role in those transitions. And there the technology just isn't quite available yet at that single cell resolution. In the blood, we can do it with these sorted populations and get an approximation, but, but not quite. But I think you're, you're, you're uh, your, the, the underpinning of your question is exactly what is needed for the field. Thank you. 
We have uh, okay, time for a quick question for this. Uh, thanks for the really interesting talk. Um, I, I noticed that you find kind of false June June B as uh, markers of your kind of HSC2 population. Um, typically, when we see these, like I, my first thought is, oh, dissociation stress, which is not the case, obviously, for your, your HSCs. Um, how do you uh, interpret these kind of regulators uh, which have been associated otherwise with dissociation stress and therefore low quality cells in this context? Um. Hmm. I'm not sure how I can answer your question directly. Um, I mean, you know, there, there, obviously there are things that we need to, you know, like I said, this is all, you know, pretty new work. And uh, I guess the data that we have is what we have available to us. I, I can't, I can't, I don't think I can answer your question. I'm not sure how we would have to think about it. Thank you very much. We are out of time. Thank you, John. Thank okay. you. Thank you for your talk and insight. Okay, everyone. We'll now move to our first group of breakout sessions. The topics and the locations are uh, on this slide. Uh, for those who are uh, participating virtually, if you go to the agenda in the event platform, you'll see a watch button, and you can join the breakout discussions through that watch button. Uh, we'll have 45 minutes for the break, sorry, 75 minutes for the breakout group. Uh, we'll then have a nice long break and we'll come back here at 445 for the lightning talks followed by the poster reception. Thank you.